Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar. On behalf of the Leap for FNSSA project, I'd like to welcome you all. I'd like to thank you all for attending. And of course, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Yannick Fiedler from FAO. Um, I'm Nurhane Dalel from the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt. Uh, and I would be uh, pleased to give you a brief introduction on our uh, Leap for FNSA project and um, uh, walk you through the session of today. Today, uh, our webinar will be under the title of Empowering the Community Through Inclusiveness and Engagement in the Food and Nutrition Security and Sustainable Agriculture Sector. We will be discussing the report of Empowering Youth to Engage in Responsible Investment in Agriculture and Food Systems, which was released by the FAO organization. The Leaf for FNSSA project is a coordination and support action to establish a sustainable platform for the efficient implementation of the AU-EU Research and Innovation Partnership, as described in the roadmap. The purpose of Leaf for FNSSA is to be the catalyzer of this transformation from a partnership into a bicontinental platform. The main actions are supporting the Guru of the AU-EU-HLPD in implementing the roadmap, creating strategic alliances of actors committed to align their activities to the roadmap, strengthening the knowledge base to increase the efficiency of research and innovation, and finally facilitating with relevant research and innovation networks. We have 35 partners <coughs> from, 20, from 23 countries, uh, 20 partners from Europe, 15 from Africa. Uh, we have France, Netherlands, Ghana, Germany, Finland, Czech Republic, South Africa, Denmark, Egypt, Nigeria, Hungary, Ethiopia, Spain, Sweden, Uganda, Kenya, Italy, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Austria, Greece, UK, and Portugal. We have different institutions. Some are universities, some are ministries, some are private organizations. Let's see. We have a series of four webinars. We already had one in last October. It was under the title of Dynamics of the AU-EU Approaches for Rural Transformation. The second one is what we are having today, the empowering of community through inclusiveness and engagement in the food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture sector. We have two other webinars foreseen in uh, the next month, which are uh, the third one is unlocking the potential of AU-EU Alliance for Sustainable Investment, Job Creation and Strengthening the Economic Networks, and finally boosting synergies between the entrepreneurship, research, innovation, and industry with end users in the food and agriculture sector. Today's webinar will be a reflection and discussion on the report of the FAO, which is empowering youth to engage in responsible investment in agriculture and food systems, the challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned from 11 African countries. This report aims to enhance understanding on the main challenges and opportunities to empower youth to carry out and benefit from responsible agricultural investment by giving voice to the most concerned, the young farmers, agri-entrepreneurs, workers, and those who support them. It summarizes the main findings from a series of multi-stakeholder capacity assessment workshops with participants from 11. Our speaker for today is Dr. Yannick Fiedler. He's a program officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. He works with policymakers and non-state actors in North and West Africa to create an enabling environment for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems with a specific focus on the needs of young agri-entrepreneurs. He is the author of several papers and publications and developer of a series of capacity development tools on responsible investment. He was also a consultant for FAO and the World Bank and taught international relations. Today's agenda will be composed of two sessions. The first one is the challenges and opportunities to empower youth to engage in investment in agriculture and food systems. It will tackle the empowering of youth to engage in responsible investment uh, and the economic and demographic trends, institution policy and regulatory frameworks, the access to services, and a holistic approach. Afterwards, we'll have a 10 minutes for questions and answer. You can either raise your hands or just type, type in the question. Then we will follow with the second session, which is the lessons learned and experiences from 11 African countries. And this will discuss the strengthening of the participation of youth in policy dialogue, the key areas to, stren to strengthen the policy, legal, and regulatory framework, ensuring that 
vulnerable or minority subgroups are not left out, and finally, the potential of regional knowledge sharing. And then we will also wrap up with a session of question and answers uh, for, for another 10 minutes. I really hope today is a, is a very uh, fruitful discussion and uh, an interactive one. So I would like to welcome Dr. Yannick Fiedler to take on from here. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Norhan, for, for introducing me and thank you for this great opportunity to present our work uh, during this webinar series. I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to be with all of you. Brief introduction on um, the topic itself uh, before going into the, the various areas uh, of our discussion today. Um, so first of all, I would like to highlight that empowering youth and increasing first two SDGs, uh, the eradication of, of poverty and hunger by 2030, uh, we need to increase investments by an additional annual amount of $265 billion, of which more than 50% should target agriculture. And at the same time, these investments need to be responsible. They need to aim to and actually generate positive social, economic, and environmental impacts to fully contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. And the CFS principles for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems that our, our team has um, been charged to promote uh, for FAO provides quite a useful uh, guidance framework in this regard. Now, for us, empowering young agri entrepreneurs to invest in their own farms and businesses along agricultural value chains should be a priority focus in this regard for three reasons. First of all, it's a matter of long-term food security. We know that global food production would need to increase by 60% by 2050 to satisfy additional demand generated by population and income growth in developing countries. And in order to satisfy this demand, we will need to tackle the challenge uh, of an aging labor force and to close the generation gap in agriculture. According to a recent FAO study in Africa, but also in developed countries, the average age of farmers is about 60, although 60% 60 of Africa's population is under 24 years of age. The second important point, of course, is to contribute to sustainable development and value addition, um, because we know that by harnessing their innovative potential, utilizing new technologies and techniques, and taking advantage of new opportunities in emerging value chains, Young agri-entrepreneurs could create thriving businesses and tackle the challenge of a growing population. The third point, which is very obvious, I think, is the matter of decent employment and thriving rural areas. We know that it is important to attract and retain youth in agricultural value chains to reduce unemployment and distress migration, because the urban sector has only limited capacities to absorb a growing youth population in many of today's developing countries and regions, and that therefore employment in agricultural value chains which includes both production and post-harvest activities, remains the principal livelihood opportunities for many youth. Now, the challenge is, of course, that youth are often unable to carry out the investments needed to launch or scale up their farm and non-farm business activities. And this is a challenge that is increasingly recognized priority at global and regional levels. If you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, again, SDG 8 and the Target 6 in particular, aims to reduce substantially the number of youth not in employment, education, or training. The Malabo Declaration of the African Union aims to uh, integrate 30% of the youth in agricultural value chains, and the CFS Right Principle 4 specifically calls to engage and empower youth. So this was our starting point when we launched our work on youth three, three years ago now. And we figured that in order to, to really, I mean, do get things right, the most important thing initially is to assess, plan, and prioritize strategically uh, to achieve sustainable processes and outcomes. So we worked with 11 African countries to date to assess the current challenges and opportunities to empower young agri entrepreneurs to engage in agriculture investment, which in the end gave rise to the first publication that you have seen. So there are three types of assessment we have carried out. One is the light assessment with a three-day multi-stakeholder workshop, an intermediary methodology with a baseline study and three days multi-stakeholder workshop. 
and the comprehensive methodology which combines studies, interviews, series of subnational and national identification and validation workshops. And this work we have carried out with the generous support from Switzerland. So look quickly at the, at the importance of this issue by, by having a quick glance at the economic and demographic trends and looking at the socio-economic importance of agriculture in the 11 countries we worked with, which were Guinea, Malawi, Mali, Mozambique, and Uganda, which are low-income countries, Côte d'Ivoire, Mauritania, and Senegal, which are low-middle-income countries, and Tunisia, Namibia, and South Africa. Namibia and South Africa are upper-middle-income countries, and as you see, Tunisia is, statistically speaking, a low-middle-income country, but it has more similitudes with the upper-middle-income countries in, in many regards. So if you look at this, this table, which um, uh, exemplifies the socioeconomic importance of agriculture in these 11 countries, you find that in the lower income countries, the um, importance of agriculture is very strong. It's, it provides up to uh, 60 to 70 percent of employment opportunities for the total populations, which are predominantly rural. Um, but the contribution of agriculture to the GDP is very low compared to this very high level of, of employment. It's approximately one third on average of its contribution to employment. So this discrepancy at first already indicates, I mean, of course, the strong opportunities to increase productivity by closing yield gaps, increase the quality of produce, reduce post harvest losses and, and so forth. Then if you look at the three low middle income countries, we exclude Tunisia here, the share of the rural population is closer to 50%. And so is the share of people deriving their main livelihoods opportunities from agriculture. It's also close to 50%, except in Senegal, where it's lower, it's close to 30%. And the discrepancy between the contribution of agriculture to employment and the GDP is also a bit lower, even if it's still quite high, it's close to 50% on average. In the two upper middle income countries in Tunisia, the share of the rural population is much lower than 50%. Percent uh, normally, and the share of agriculture in total employment is up to 20% or lower, and the contribution of agriculture to the GDP is below 10%. So, in these countries, you see that primary agriculture may already be very productive, and um, there may not be very, very significant margins anymore to achieve. I mean, at this stage, the value chains may be even uh, saturated already, but important opportunities may exist to increase further value added down the value chain and, and increase uh, the, the value of the produce. Uh, what I did not include in this, in this uh, graphic, because you wouldn't even be able to really uh, notice these figures in this graphic, is the share of agriculture in total investments. If you look at the, at the level of, in, of agriculture investments in total investments, normally, lower than five percent and in many cases it's even three percent so this is why we in, in fao refer to this very huge investment gap the underinvestment in the agriculture sector now let us have a quick look at the youth employment trends and here uh, you find quite an interesting pattern as well um, the youth unemployment rates are usually re relatively low in the low income countries malawi is, is quite a notable exception here whereas the youth underemployment rates are relatively high between 15 and, and 25 percent. Um, in the, the lower middle, it's are only slightly higher than in low-income countries, but the underemployment rate may be even slightly lower. Um, what does this tell us about both groups is that many youth are part of the working poor who have a job, but who do not earn enough to make a decent living. So among the young workers in these countries, more than one in three were living in extreme or moderate poverty in 2018. And as agriculture is the main source of livelihood opportunities for these young people, the challenge is to support them to move from subsistence farming on family farms owned by the parents or occasional labor on plantations towards maybe uh, sustainable small scale commercial farming or post harvest activities. In the uh, lower middle income country, in the upper middle income countries and Tunisia, uh, the, the youth un and underemployment rates are very high. They are between 22% in Tunisia for the 25-34 year cohort, up to 53% for the 15 to 24 year cohort in South Africa. And what you find here is, is um, 
very often a skills mismatch, which is due to what uh, some economists refer to as overeducation. That means that there are many very qualified youth, but that can uh, have a hard time finding a qualified employment uh, on the labor market. So it's an important challenge that um, we should support them. Uh, these young people have recently graduated from universities or agribusinesses to set up their own farming or agribusiness uh, activities. Now let us have a look at the, at the key challenges and opportunities uh, for, um, for, for young agri entrepreneurs. Uh, and I would like to start this with a quote uh, from a participant we had at one of our capacity assessments who said, there are many programs and initiatives for the youth, but never any programs and initiatives by and with the youth. And um, what happens is that many countries uh, we found have good consultation and coordination mechanisms in place to engage with different stakeholders on, on issues related to agriculture investment, but that there is kind of uh, an, an unsatisfactory participation of youth organizations and, and representatives of the youth in policy making processes which negatively impacts their capacity to meaningfully influence these processes. So what are the main challenges? On the one hand, we find that there is a need to strengthen the organizational capacities of the youth. So in many countries, uh, the youth, they may either not have their own organizations that represent their interests, or there may be a multitude of organizations which makes it difficult for governments to identify legitimate interlocutors. Who, who speaks on behalf of the youth is a very important question that is very hard to identify in many cases, and I will come back to this point more in detail in the second presentation. Um, the second challenge relates to the advocacy capacities of the youth leaders. So, and this is, this is an important challenge, is that they may not always be well equipped to engage in discussions with uh, senior policymakers and, and non-state actors who may have stronger advocacy and lobbying skills. So it is also important to, to work on that and to ensure that they can effectively participate in, in, in policymaking processes. And then there is a, a third point that is important important, which are the perceptions among decision makers on the youth. Uh, it's not something we have found in, 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 in all countries, but in some of them, is that there may be some stereotypes related to the youth, uh, that they are not yet um, informed and experienced enough to be included in decision-making processes that concern them, because in the end, there may be experts, uh, older experts, who may know much better than the youth themselves what they actually need. Um, then, as regards the, the policies and, and, and uh, regulatory frameworks themselves, we found that in most cases, they're actually quite good. Uh, most countries have specific youth employment strategies in place. Some of of them, uh, to which one specific exception, which relates to uh, the case of appropriate incentives that I will come back to in the second presentation. But on the overall like macro policy framework, this is the general feedback. Now, there are a series of challenges, and um, there are five that we have, we have identified. Um, and the first one maybe is the need for a clear, coherent policy framework that strategically promotes and facilitates different types of investment and ensures complementarity between them. What do we mean by that? We mean that, <clears throat> in general, there may be, uh, on the one hand, in the investment code, specific strategies to enhance larger scale investment, and there may be some programs to uh, promote uh, investments by young agro entrepreneurs, but they're often conceived as parts of different boxes, whereas it would be important to conceive them as one uh, strategic framework uh, to seek complementarity between these types of different investments. The second challenge is the effective implementation of, of policies and strategies in particular, um, due to budgetary, procedural, and human resources constraints. In some cases, you may find good, very good um, strategies that then cannot be implemented because of, of budgetary constraints. Uh, the third point is the limited awareness 
basis of strategy and, and, and in, in cases we organized our capacity assessments, we found that uh, the government has put in place marvelous um, programs for, for the youth, but the youth may not always be aware of these opportunities that exist. So there is a need also to communicate them. Uh, the fourth point, of course, is the transparency of the processes, particularly when it comes to the allocation of public resources, including, uh, for example, incentives for young agri-entrepreneurs to be sure that everybody understands who is being selected to be eligible and, and why. And um, the fifth point is, is the need to move from a fragmented approach. As I said, it's, it, it relates back to the first point, as a matter of fact. Um, fragmented efforts to provide land, to provide training, to provide incentives towards a holistic and in integrated approach that would consider this as a package that would be provided um, to the young agri-entrepreneurs. So that, for example, a young agri-entrepreneur who would receive a training would then also uh, have some follow-up support to be eligible for, for some additional uh, financial incentives, some further coaching support, uh, and in some cases where you have, for example, land loans to, to access these land loans. Um, then finally, and I will, I will stop with this one, uh, the, the need to ensure the right access to services. And um, young agri-entrepreneurs need access to a series of services to launch and expand their businesses. And there are many. Uh, the three most important ones that we have identified, uh, first of all, are financial services. This includes credits, insurances, savings schemes, uh, and others. And of course, uh, in many cases, you find that there are plenty of youth organizations, NGOs, and microfinance institutions that can cover that need up to some extent, especially for, for very small uh, startup businesses. Uh, but once these young agri entrepreneurs want to expand their businesses or they require larger loans, then they often fail to access uh, financial services that are really tailored to their needs. Uh, the second point is coaching and incubation. And here we see that uh, incubation and coaching services exist in, in many countries. Uh, what maybe uh, could be expanded is that these services exist in, in many cases in the capital or in major city. And we had some good discussions with some policymakers from some countries that said, you know, we really want to move these into the rural areas to also ensure um, that the rural entrepreneurs can access them more easily. And the third point is, is access to information. Uh, um, and this includes both uh, agriculture and market related information, such as weather forecasts and, and price trends, as well as information on existing programs and incentives relates back to the point I mentioned before is that the young people, as a matter of fact, need to be aware of all the support mechanisms that are already put in place by, by the governments, by the uh, resource partners and by, by, by the NGOs and even the private sector. And here, of course, the information com uh, communication technologies, the ICTs, could play a major role in providing aggregated and easily accessible information through uh, one-stop shops. Uh, with this, I think I have uh, maxed out my 15 minutes, right? <laughs> and I'm glad to, to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick, for this very interesting presentation. And I think we can start having questions now. Please, if you have any, just type them or just raise your hand and we can open discussion. So I think we have the first one. Can you see it? Uh, interesting. And I looked at the report. Do you have good standard examples of countries doing well and engaging with youth? This is, uh, this is the question, right? Yeah. This, this question is from Mr. Thomas Tihar, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, thank you so much. I think we do have good examples. In one case, I will come back back to in, in detail in the second presentation is Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia, which has done pretty well in, in uh, providing um, a, a package of, of good incentives and support mechanisms, both in terms of coaching, incubation, um, uh, land loans, and, um, and a, a series of subsidies. The subsidy is not only available for the youth, but youth of benefited from benefited from some of these incentives can then also 
uh, access the, um, the, the, the subsidies. So Tunisia is an interesting case, and I will come back to that one later. Uh, another interesting case probably is, is Senegal. Uh, in Senegal, you do have a series of, of, of good um, mechanisms that are in place. Uh, there is a specific uh, guarantee fund for, uh, for young agri-entrepreneurs to encourage banks to lend, to um, provide loans to, to the young agri-entrepreneurs. Uh, this fund is guaranteed by the government. They have also put in place a series of um, uh, incentives mechanisms and support programs such as the uh, model d'insertion des de jeunes agri-entrepreneurs, the insertion model for young agri-entrepreneurs, Mija, which is, uh, which is quite an interesting case. Um, this, this program, Mija, has actually, uh, is, is a program in which young agri-entrepreneurs are being selected to work on an incubation farm. Um, and they're being trained by, by, uh, by experts on how to run their farming and, and agribusiness activities. Um, the, the program facilitates their access to inputs, to services and, and, and credits. And um, the interesting case with this MIJA is that in the end, the beneficiaries have joined together in a group that they call uh, RAPEA, Réseau des Agripreneurs des États Africains. It's, it's like an agribusiness network of young agri-entrepreneurs in Africa, but now it's limited to Senegal, but they have the, the will to uh, expand uh, in, into neighboring countries. So they have said, because we have benefited from this training, we want to become like uh, trained trainers on our own and really represent the, the youth, uh, providing services for the youth by the youth, but also becoming a preferred interlocutor between the youth and the government. So they, due to this support, they have become very ambitious, which I think is a good thing. And, and this is quite an interesting model. Um, there are other countries too, where you, where you find interesting cases. Um, in terms of support for the youth. Uh, one country that we didn't analyze, but I know that has done quite well too, is, is Rwanda. Uh, and, and if there is interest, I will be glad to put you in, in contact with a gentleman who has worked a lot of, on, on youth and you, uh, in Rwanda. Um, so there, there, are, there are some good, good cases. Now, the challenge, of course, is always the, the, um, the extent to which the, the governments are able to provide support to all of those who need them. And this is the, I think in many cases, this is the real challenge. It's not to say that there is a good program because there are programs that exist, but it's not the capacity to provide it to a maximum of, of beneficiaries. But on the, on the good practices, they do exist. And I will be glad also to share maybe with, uh, with you some links to relevant documents and, uh, uh, because they exist uh, documents on the specific incentive schemes and, and there are some studies. So I would be glad to do that. Okay, thank you. I think we have another question. Um, I think I can allow Mr. Jonas to talk, please. My, my question is that, uh, yeah, it is very, very interesting study. And uh, my question is, did you consider the difference between youth who graduated from the universities and youth who did not attend school or who attend school which are not agriculture oriented, for example? Um, th thank you, Jonas. This is a very good question. And actually, we, we did. Uh, and I think it's, it's a key consideration. I know that there are also different types of, of classification on, on different types of youth. I will also come back to that in the, in the second presentation where I will briefly discuss the need to consider youth as um, uh, a group um, that, that consists of many different small subgroups, right? And you mentioned one of them is the difference between the youth that have graduated from university and those youth that may or may not have even attended school and both, of course, need very different types of, of services, incentives, and support mechanisms, right? Uh, which links back to the, <clears throat> to the presentation I did in the beginning on the economic and, and demographic trends, right? 
if you look at countries like um, uh, Tunisia, for example, uh, but also the other upper middle income countries, you will find that those youth who may, uh, who may really have a hard time integrating in the labor market, maybe those who paradoxically have uh, graduated from university, right? So there is a need to, to specifically consider um, the particular needs, but also capacities of, of educated youth in these countries. Whereas in, in other countries, uh, you find that the, the youth who may struggle the most are those who have the, the lowest education degrees, who may have dropped out of school very young because um, they were obliged to help their parents on their farms. Uh, and in these cases, of course, there are different support mechanisms that are needed uh, in terms of engine services and um, like uh, youth farmer feed schools, for example, which is an approach that FAO has used. Uh, to ensure that these young people uh, also receive the support they needed to, to become autonomous and, and, and um, successful farmers, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, can, I, can I continue? A second question? For me, that's fine. If it's fine for Dr. Norhan. No, go, go ahead, Jonas. You have, you have one question. It's fine. Ah, okay. Thank you very much, thank you. Norhan. Uh, the other question is, you know, we have different uh, financial schemes, whether from uh, microfinance or from banks. Or did you go further to deeply in those different financial schemes and see which one are appropriate to use that engage in agriculture? Thank you. This is an excellent question. And I must be very honest with you. It depends on the, the countries we worked in. In those where we did a more comprehensive assessment with baseline studies, and uh, especially as we did in, in Tunisia, for example, uh, we, we were able to, to do that. Uh, so I can provide you an answer based on the information I have, but this does not apply to all of the, the 11 countries. Uh, in, in general, if you look at the different types of, of financial services, as I said, I mean, the microfinance institutions and uh, the, the rural saving associations, for example, they can do a good job in, in providing uh, very small loans. So this may be a good opportunity um, for um, a young person who uh, already owns a piece of land inherited from his parents or, um, who wants to launch like a very small processing or, or post harvest business, uh, but that would not be suitable for somebody who has already a couple of years of experience, let's say three, four years of experience and, and wants to scale up his business. Uh, so then already they, they face a challenge and this is normally when things start to get really difficult. Um, what you, what you do find also in many cases is that the microfinance institutions, of course, they are the ones who are willing to, to provide the loans um, to young agri entrepreneurs. But then uh, you may find, at least in the countries we studied, uh, an issue related to the very high interest rates that are charged by these institutions because, of course, they, they bear a huge risk of, of non-repayment, uh, but which also means that for, for a young person, uh, bearing the cost of, of accessing these loans can, can be a huge challenge. So in many cases, then they would rather revert to borrowing money from um, uh, relatives, whoever may, may have some coins to spare, and uh, um, use, use these kind of informal financing mechanisms, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jonas. I think we have another question from uh, Jackie Cado. Thank you for the presentation. I think uh, for me, my question was more around the role of seniors or role models mm -hmm. in respect to the youth and especially agriculture in Africa, where for a very long time they viewed uh, agriculture as something that it is the old, uh, older generation that are involved in. So in your study or, or uh, research, do you do you see if the older generation still have a role to play? Thank you. You mean the, the older generation in, in, in terms of being role models for, for, for the young agri-entrepreneurs? Yes. 
and what mm. what would be their contribution yes. because i mean mm. the transformation of agriculture into an enterprise is now becoming attractive to young people mm. but previously it was deemed as uh, an occupation or a sector for the older generation so with the current state do you think that the the seniors have a role to play <laughs> That's a very good and a very provocative question, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's it's the. I think, as a matter of fact, you know, um, the the young people per se, uh, they they may have all the the innovative capacities, but what they can always benefit from their their elders, of course, is the experience, right? And um, mm -hmm. what you find in many cases is that there may be older peers who may uh, play the role of being mentors um, to their younger fellows uh, in terms of, of knowing, I mean, the kind of challenges they face when they set up a business and uh, they may have the, the right kind of networks and the right kind of connections and um, um, having these, these elders becoming like mentors for for the young agro entrepreneurs i think is is a marvelous thing that you can see mm -hmm. happening in some countries it's not something we focused on in the context of our study but it's something of course that we have come across uh by just seeing um looking looking at how how things work if you see that you have for example this this again is a case from tunisia that i found quite interesting older persons becoming volunteer coaches they charge like very low fees. They almost do it like voluntarily uh, to mm -hmm. support young agri entrepreneurs setting up their businesses. And I think this is great. Okay. So of course they, 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 they are there and they should be there to actually play their part also in empowering and, and partnering with the, with the youth. Yes, but that's an informal role. It's not a formal role because like when they go to get, for instance, bank loans, Mm -hmm. for agriculture it is not a requirement that the guarantor or the proposer be a senior person mm -hmm. i'm uh, ex excuse me could you try to reformulate your question i'm not quite sure i get all the the extent of it okay so what i'm saying is the role you've just described mm -hmm. is an informal role mm -hmm. uh when the youth for instance, get uh, loans for agricultural mm -hmm. uh, practices, there's no formal requirement that they need to engage with the seniors. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I'm asking. Oh, no, 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 there is no formal, no, 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 there is no formal requirement, even though, of course, it can be quite good for a young person to have, um, to be able to partner, so to speak, with a, uh, we, um, with an older person who can who can be a grantor, it, it makes things mm. easier, of course, when you apply for a loan, and it also makes things easier, as I said, in terms of even launching and expanding the business, because you will be able to benefit from somebody who has years and years of experience in knowing on how to run these operations, right? Even if it's maybe yeah. not using the same kind of of, of business model, um, still the, the experience of running a business is there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks a lot for the for answering my question. Okay, I think we can have just two more fast questions. We have uh, Mathilde Darigo, please, if you can, if you can hear us. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Please go on. I I have uh, a question about the European uh, junk. Is probably uh, I like to motivate participate in rural areas. In, in rural areas, because I I live in a town where the people is is uh, are all the people are, are all. And um, how do you think that young people want to participate in rural areas? Yes, thank you for this question. And it's a very important question because it relates back to the issue: how do we make the rural areas attractive for the youth? Right. And this is a very uh, complicated and I guess context specific question if you look at the different in the different countries. I mean, one thing is the economic opportunity, right? What does, uh, what is the kind of incentive for a young person to leave the city and go back to the rural area 
if if there is a specific mechanism in place and the opportunity is high uh, that you will find a better job there maybe this is already a good incentive right uh, but this may not be enough of course and um, uh, what we what we heard in many cases and it's, it's it's quite fascinating of course for young people for young person what may be uh, as important as the economic opportunity uh, may be access to all sorts of, of, of services, including just uh, an internet connection to watch the football game on Saturday or Sunday, right? Um, so this kind of, 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 of access to, uh, to this kind of infrastructure can also, be, can also play an important role. And then I guess, then it becomes very context specific also because then there may be cultural factors. For example, if you look at a country like um, a country like Senegal the Senegalese I think they are very proud right of their different traditions and regions and so if if you would give them what they need to stay where they are I think they're most of them from what I heard at least they're glad to do so then there may be other cultures where where there is more of a drain into the city because it's really where everybody wants to be and it's it's just the place to be for a young person right so it's then, then you start to touch upon these kind of cultural issues that become very context specific, and I guess where you would really need to look in depth into each different situation. Uh, but the overall factor I think that is important to bear in mind is the economic incentive. I think this is valid for all countries. Is what do I have to gain if I go back to rural area, and how uh, do different uh, projects and programs support me if I want to set up a business there? Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I, I think one last question from from Gaetano, and then we can continue with our second presentation, and then at the end. Yeah, thank you for your speech. Uh, um, maybe my question is uh, just a, a bit out of the field. Um, so uh, we are going in uh, our project to push a young innovator to express their capability uh, in um, presenting uh, attractive ideas uh, and one of the stumping block blocks is uh, the problem that they are not able to provide a good uh, business plan and so in most of the case uh, uh, startups uh, um, so are going to to fail in the first uh, one or two years uh, so my question is uh, uh, one of the uh, problem is that uh, in the cooperation uh, project uh, uh, most of the cooperation projects are more focused on provide subsidies uh, or to provide training uh, to young people but uh, are not able to train them to uh, face the, the business, so the market, uh, uh, and so how we can uh, overcome this, this kind of, of problem. Uh, how uh, the training or, uh, yeah, the training could be uh, improved in order to provide to this uh, young innovator a marginal categories, I, I told also to women, to, uh, 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 to achieve uh, skills in the field of uh, uh, business plan and to uh, have the more capability to uh, uh, afford the market. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gaetano. I think this is this is an excellent question, and it's 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 one of the many challenges you actually face, as you said, in in many cases, is that there may be very good programs in place, but the the projects uh, that are set up by the youth still still tend to fail after. A year or two. So, what can be done? I think one one question is, of course, as you said, is that the training should be quite hands-on and and really tailored to to the reality of the market. Uh, here again, I mean, is um, one one idea could be uh, that an incubation center would train the youth on on setting up their business plans, and would then actually help the young people pilot that same business plan at a very very small scale before scaling up into something that would be commercially viable right uh, and once this is commercially viable then you would come in and provide the subsidies again it's a matter i think for me even if there is no no silver bullet and it, each context is is, is is specific of course 
uh, it's, it's quite important, I think, to follow this kind of integrated approach to see what are the different steps to ensure that the business from a young agri-entrepreneur is valid, what are the kind of support mechanisms that are already in place, and then where can, in, in this case, the, the donor or the resource partner come in and complement uh, wherever they may be supposed to. I don't know if this answered your question, but I think it goes in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and sorry for the rest of the questions, but we have to go on with the second presentation and then we will get back maybe at the end if we have the time. So Yannick, please go on with the second presentation, please. So now this the second part, I would really like to, to share some very practical lessons learned and, and experiences based on cases from the 11 African countries we worked in. And as I said before, I mean, the study you have seen was a very preliminary study on the six initial countries, but now we're up to 11. Uh, we hope to, to further scale up in Africa. We're also working in Southeast Asia. So hopefully there will be some new publication that will, that will take into account also these, these new experiences, which I somewhat try to integrate into the presentation now. Um, so as we discussed before, one key, um, challenge uh, would be um, to empower youth to participate in policy dialogue, um, which is really a precondition for the development of, of successful and, and youth sensitive policies. So what would be the three areas that would need to be tackled? One is um, the existence of an inclusive and, and efficient multi-stakeholder platform um, that, that would really be considered as preferred public spaces for, for deliberation on macro policy choices, uh, maybe not on the laws and the decrees, but at least on the, on the broader policy framework and strategic choices. Then related to that, of course, the organizational capacities of young agri-entrepreneurs uh, that I've already touched upon in, in the last presentation, I would just go uh, into detail a bit more here, is that, um, as I said, there may not only, only be a multitude of organizations, which makes it difficult for, for governments to identify legitimate interlocutors, um, but there is also the question of the legitimacy of the youth organizations themselves. Uh, one is the, um, the question of the represent, uh, representativeness of, of the youth organizations. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but we found quite interesting organizations in, in, in which the youth leaders uh, are 50 or 60 years old. Um, in other cases, uh, you may have youth organizations which have been created uh, because it, it was a requirement to access some funds which are provided by donors. And then when the project is over, these uh, organizations gradually disappear. Uh, so it's, it's quite important to really strengthen these, these capacities of the youth to organize themselves beyond the life cycle of a project. Um, and also to, to really see how you can institutionalize a, a, a powerful and vibrant youth organization. And I think that the, uh, in Senegal, you have a couple of cases that are quite interesting, where you have quite a vibrant civil society. You have what they call uh, Les Jeunes du CNCR. CNCR is, is, is a committee on, 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 on rural areas. And within that committee, they have a youth group that exists, I think, since 2012 or so, and all the members are between 20 and 39 years old, and 60%, if I remember correctly, of these members are women, young women. And this is quite a, a vibrant organization from, from whom I met some of the members, and another one is this, this Rapi Amija that I discussed before. Uh, there are others that I will uh, present also, but this, this is quite an interesting example. Then the challenge is really, as I said before, to strengthen the advocacy capacities of these youth leaders um, to really engage with, with policymakers, right? This, this is another challenge again. So in many cases, as I said, uh, there is no unified youth organization that could take the, um, the role of a preferred interlocutor for, for the government and, and other stakeholders. So. Uh, we at FAO have tried to see exactly in the case of Senegal, where you have a couple of these very good organizations, how we could support them in um, setting up a unified federation of youth organizations. 
we're currently working in Senegal together with an organization that is called Ricolto um, through these um, different steps, four different steps. The first is mapping of youth organizations at national level to really find out, I mean, the kind of universe of um, different organizations that exist, uh, what their respective uh, fields of intervention are, the focus, mission, uh, membership, um, scale. Uh, subsequently work with these organizations to identify their needs and priorities and based on this on this identification see how we can support them to identify a common roadmap with common needs and priorities that would allow them to somewhat build a unified federation of youth organizations within that specific scope and then in parallel also strengthen the advocacy skills of, of, of the leaders of these organizations so this is something that we're currently carrying out in, in Senegal uh, based on the fact that so many good organizations are already out there and that they even have an interest in, 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 in working together. Um, then there is one interesting case on the participation and policy dialogue, which is the case of Mali, uh, which I would like to share with you, which has come across, I mean, in, in our work as something quite strong and unique. Uh, in Mali, uh, you have a Supreme Council on Agriculture, uh, Conseil Supérieur de l'Agriculture, which is a high-level multi-stakeholder platform, um, which, is, which is directly tied to, to the presidents of, of the Republic. So it's, it has a very strong political buy-in, and it's the preferred public policy space in which um, people try to concert and, 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 and consult to reach a common agreement on macro policy choices on agricultural development. And within this, um, this Conseil Supérieur, uh, the youth are represented through the National Federation of Rural Youth, uh, FENAGER, which is a, an umbrella organization that has more than 5,000 member organizations in Mali that has different chapters at the sub-national level. So it's, it's quite a well-structured organization. And um, this somewhat confers the, the youth a specific role that they can play within this council in um, uh, raising their concerns and, and, and claiming their interests, which I think is, is, is quite an interesting case. Uh, and there too, I think there's, there are some interesting uh, uh, documentations also to share. Now, uh, the second point we discussed, which is quite important, of course, relates to, to the policy and legal frameworks. And here I would like to go back to the issue of incentives, which is something that has uh, come across as being really important in the context of empowering young agri-entrepreneurs and also in terms of making agriculture and agricultural value chains attractive for the youth, which is, which is one of the key challenges uh, that you always hear when it comes to these big youth conferences is how do we make agriculture attractive for the youth. So what we find as of today is that there are many tangible incentives um, that are provided for in, in the various investment codes and of, of, of the different countries and most of them aim to stimulate larger scale investment. So uh, in many cases this may be fiscal incentives um, that would require a certain uh, threshold of capital turnover or capital investment to be eligible for these incentives. And de facto, most of the young agri entrepreneurs are not eligible for, for these incentives. So there are a few incentives for young agri entrepreneurs, which doesn't mean that there are none. Some of, some of them exist, <clears throat> and some of them are even, even, even very good. In most cases, these are then financial incentives or indirect incentives such as the, the youth guarantee funds that we have seen in, in, in Senegal. There may be intangible incentives such as coaching and, and, and training programs. Um, and, and what we felt is that while these, these um, programs and incentives are quite good, there are some things that could be improved. And again, this is just a general outline and, and you would need to look at each of them specifically. But these would be the three uh, three areas, key areas for reflection. One of them is the selection criteria. Uh, how are um, the beneficiaries for, for these um, uh, financial incentives or coaching, training, incubation programs selected? And here again, I think it's, it's important to bear in mind that it's of course 
preferable uh, to seek long-term impacts and strong multiplier effects rather than short-term benefits in terms of uh, providing employment to, to youth in particularly disadvantaged areas. The second one is strategic alignment. And here we come back to the discussions we had uh, before is that it's important to integrate different types of incentives and services into comprehensive packages. And then last but not least, it's important to really communicate and disseminate information, ensure that rules and regulations are intelligible and to facilitate procedures to the largest extent possible. Now, here are three interesting cases that I would uh, like to present very briefly. Uh, one of them are these land loans that are provided by the Tunisian Agriculture Investment Promotion Agency, which, which are quite a fascinating thing. Basically, um, this, this agency, APIA, provides a loan to uh, young agri-entrepreneurs who meet a series of criteria. They must have a diploma in, in, in agriculture, agronomic studies uh, from a recognized university. They must be younger than 40 years and they can have access to these loans to buy and clear the land. Uh, the grace period is seven years, the interest rate is three percent, uh, which is quite generous, and um, once they have had access to these land loans, then they can also access the various subsidies uh, that are um, foreseen in the, the investment code. Um, the second interesting case is <clears throat> that the um, government of Mali makes available state-owned cleared land and there is a specific quota reserved for youth and women groups. Uh, the quota is, I think it's 15%. Uh, and it's something that is directly stipulated in the agricultural, in, in the agricultural land law uh, that has been developed um, also as part of the, the larger macro policy deliberations in the, in the Conseil Supérieur de l'Agriculture. And then the last model is the um, Young Agri Entrepreneurs Insertion Model in Senegal, which I have already discussed in the question answer session, so I won't get back to that for the sake of time. Um, now, last, uh, the last point uh, that is uh, quite important, I think, in general, is to consider vulnerable and minority subgroups. It's something that has been answered also in the various question boxes is that we need to be sure that we don't consider youth as one group, one unified group, but as a diverse group with diverse needs. Uh, of course, there are educated, non-educated youth, the rural urban youth, male and female, and the younger youth, which are 15 to 70 years, and the older youth, 18 to 35 years. What is important to bear in mind is that some may be more vulnerable than others, or may specific, face specific challenges in particular contexts. Uh, for young women, for example, uh, there may be in some contexts the double burden of being a youth and a female, which may lead to a kind of double stigma uh, of, of, of being not recognized as a person who may or should have um, a voice in, in, in uh, deliberation processes on specific issues. Uh, then there is the group of younger youth, 15 to 70 years. This group is, is particularly uh, interesting because they're not, no longer children. In many cases, when you're 15, you're allowed to work, uh, even though you're not allowed to do hazardous work, but you're not yet a young adult either. And this group is particularly likely to be not in education, employment, or training, more than any other group. Uh, and then finally, uh, in upper middle income countries, and this is the, the less intuitive case that I've discussed before, there is the specific challenge of the educated youth, uh, those who have gone to university, who have good degrees, but who have a really hard time in, in finding decent employment. Finally, and with this I will close, uh, and this I found was an interesting, uh, interesting request that came um, through, through Dr. Norhan, was to discuss the importance of regional knowledge sharing. Um, and, and here I think, uh, we're actually in, in, in quite a good group already because we're, we're exactly working within that spirit, right? Regional knowledge sharing. Is that regional knowledge sharing for us, as we have seen it, is, um, is, 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 is a really good way to identify new solutions, seek inspiration from others, and, and to foster collective uh, innovation. And of course, this can take various forms. It can be face-to-face, -face, it can be online, can be through WhatsApp groups and others. 
And uh, what we have seen last year is when we brought together uh, policymakers, young agri entrepreneurs, and, and NGOs from Northern and, and Western Africa, uh, that there was some kind of a mutual learning about things that worked well in other countries that were quite fascinating in general. And I really simplify here, but it's, it, it was quite fascinating was that the um, uh, Maghreb countries that we invited, they really looked um, towards the Malians and the Senegalese with, um, with quite some fascination on how they, uh, the NGOs um, managed to, to become autonomous and the, the young agri entrepreneurs set up their own federations that were very vibrant and, and well recognized. Whereas the um, uh, Western African uh, stakeholders, they really uh, look towards um, the, the Moroccans and the Tunisians, uh, the Tunisian investment code, how it specifically provides incentives for the youth, and the, the Plan Maroc Vert, which, which is really structured uh, support program, both for larger and smaller scale investments. And there was a lot of mutual learning ongoing that I think was really beneficial for, for all of them. And it's something that shouldn't be underestimated in terms of, of empowering the youth, because uh, as we have seen, there are so many good examples already out there and experimented in the different countries. It's just that uh, it's important, I think, to, to raise awareness on the, on the different success stories that exist. And I'm also glad that I could contribute to this uh, on a very small scale today in this, in this webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Yannick, for this very informative presentation. And I think we can start by taking questions. And maybe we can continue um, the last questions from the last session, and then we can take more. We have Emmanuel, if you can hear us. Yes, hello. Hello. Yes, please yes. go on with the question. Yes, my name is Emmanuel Atamba from, uh, from Nairobi. Um, and uh, my question is, uh, when you're talking about incentivizing young people, and uh, mainly, uh, even here in Kenya, the conversation is always about, uh, you know, the economic incentives. And then uh, you find now young people going into farming and not, for example, respecting nature. Uh, you know, young people going into farming, you know, with uh, you know, using um, extraordinarily amount, high amounts of uh, of agrochemicals, for example, mm. because then the incentive is to get money. So how do we balance between uh, you know the actual interest of young people uh, to get into farming and to understand how mm -hmm. farming works and how nature works mm -hmm. um, as opposed to get into farming because they are not you know successful in other mm -hmm. in other sectors so otherwise then we you know we we we, 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 are, get, we are getting into a bigger problem uh, mm -hmm. than we are actually we actually are and I'm a young person so it's not that I'm discriminating on anyone thank mm -hmm. you yeah Thank, thank you, Emmanuel. I think this is a very, very important point. And since we're speaking about responsible investment, it should even be one of our principal considerations here. So, so thank you, really. Uh, I think that it's, it's a matter of, of the conditions, right, of, con of, of attaching incentives to, to the right conditions. Um, so, for example, what you do see, and again, here's the case from Tunisia, is that subsidies are provided, for example, for using water saving technologies, um, mm -hmm. which, is, which is quite an interesting case, right? So you wouldn't want to incentivize a young uh, person or any other farmer, as a matter of fact, uh, for wasting water in a region that is already quite scarce on, on water. Uh, so this is, is, is quite an interesting case. Uh, what you could see also in other cases is that you would want to uh, include young people into incubation programs with a high impact on sustainable development beyond the mere uh, financial economic profitability, right? So I think it's a matter really uh, on setting the right kind of criteria uh, in ensuring that those who are il 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 eligible for the incentives in the end also are able to um, have a positive impact uh, in terms of sustainable development in their communities. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we have another one from uh, Leonard Huffland, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Leonard, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question about what was about how we can not only talk about the youth, but how to include them. And I think the second presentation you um, 
shed more light upon that. So thank you for that. Um, and so maybe we can go on to another question. Uh, I'm Lizzie Iwine. Yes, uh, we are discussing responsible investments in agriculture. But most of the time in countries, I mean, Nigeria, investments for agriculture does not get to the farmers. It comes to the governors or goes through the minister to the contractors. So at the end of the day, the farmer does not get anything to take him or her to the farm. How can we reverse our investment, especially in this season of COVID? The farmers need to go back to farm and we need to upscale our production. How will countries do responsible in, in investments in bringing these monies to the hand of farmers? Because that is where the problem is. Thank you very much. I'm speaking from Abuja, Nigeria. Hello, hello, Joyce, and um, and thank you for this very important questions and greetings to to Abuja. Um, I think that this is this is an important question, right? Is to ensure that the larger scale uh, private investments directly benefit the farmers. And here there are uh, a lot of ways to ensure that the farmers directly benefit, including the, the, the young farmers and the women farmers from, from larger scale investments. Um, one important way of doing though that, that we have identified as FAO, and there again, I will be glad to share some publications or, or put you in touch with the, with the right persons who have worked much more on this issue than I have, uh, is the case of inclusive business models inclusive business models in which um, you would combine the um, uh, capacity of larger scale investors with the um, know-how and capacity of the, the local small scale producers and, and businesses, uh, such as through responsible contract farming, uh, joint venture, outgrower schemes and others. Uh, so these kind of models do exist. Now, of course, as you say, uh, it's a matter of providing the right enabling environment, the right uh, policy regulation regulatory and incentives frameworks for these larger scale investors to consider working with the local producers rather than say buy large tracts of land um, that would lead maybe to the to the expropriation of these these small scale producers so uh, there are many I think many good things that can be done and there are many good cases that have been documented and here again I mean if you want um, I can see uh, if 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 uh, I can try to find the right studies and the right persons to put you in touch with. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. My thank name you. is Liz. You've been thank you, Liz. Yes. I was sending something to Joyce. I now put her name. No, we're My sorry for that, Lizzie. Thank you so much. We can have another question from Justin or Ser, if you're there, please. Uh, so, yeah, I want. To, I would like to know which is the role of farmer organization and uh, cooperative in this process of uh, inclusion of young people. And uh, do you think that um, in uh, enhancing the role and the participation of young people in uh, cooperative and farmer organization governance can uh, lead to to, and the result in concrete uh, incentives to to young agri entrepreneurs. And have have you noticed some interesting example uh, in your uh, study? Yes, thank thank you, Justine, for uh, for these questions. And 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 definitely, uh, cooperatives and, and farmer organizations can be can be quite uh, powerful vehicles uh, to to empower young agro entrepreneurs mm -hmm. either if they constitute themselves uh, as, as cooperative or farmer organizations, or if they join them and, and then can have access to, to, to markets and, and, and credits um, uh, more easily. I think this is, this is definitely the case. Um, here, here again, on a very practical level, I, I do understand that this is uh, uh, at least partially being done by, by Fenager in, in Mali. Uh, they, uh, they work together really in terms of, of, of um, uh, supporting uh, young farmers joining together. Uh, uh, we have also had, had cases, of course, where you see that young people uh, may not be interested in, in joining these cooperatives, which is quite interesting. 
Uh, so there is also some, I think, communication and awareness raising work that can be done in, in some contexts in, in explaining uh, and communicating to the young people the benefits of, of joining these kind of organizations, including in terms of having easier access to some of the um, subsidies that may be provided or inputs, uh, et cetera. So it, it, can be, it can be an important vehicle. Uh, now, of course, the, uh, the cooperatives and the farmer organizations must be, be ready to consider the specific challenges of the youth, which in some cases they, they really do. And also the young people must uh, have like a strengthened awareness of, of the benefits of, of joining these organizations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have another one from Jesus Escudero, please. Okay, I think. We can move to the, yeah, I think we can move to another question. Techno pouvoir. My question is, you know, as today the climate change is uh, occurring, how can we finance the small scale farmers investment incentive in climate smart agriculture practices, especially women farmers? That's my question. Excuse me, I, I, I didn't hear you very well. Uh, okay. Could you just confirm that the question was about how to allow farmers to adapt climate smart agriculture practices? Uh, my question is to know how to finance small scale farmers' capacities or investment incentive in climate smart agriculture practices and especially women farmers okay thank you now i <laughs> now i understood you better that's that's good uh i think the, the this this is an important question that is maybe a bit beyond the 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 topic of this presentation but it's it's an important question i know it's also a, an important priority for our for our organization of course in the end it, again it's a question of both uh, the right incentives, but also the right kind of support mechanisms, I guess, the right kind of uh, extension services and, and strengthened capacities uh, to allow these, these farmers to adapt uh, climate smart agriculture practices. Uh, but, but again, let us, uh, um, let us consider it in, 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 this, in these terms for the time being. Then if you're, you're interested in this climate smart agriculture issue, uh, I can also try there again to, to provide you with the right kind of, of documentation. Okay. Okay, so another question from Lillian. Hi, this is Lillian. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is um, regarding um, the gender dynamics within the community. I just wanted to know if uh, your study um, covered um, the gender dynamics and if um, this uh, gender dynamics uh, had uh, could have a potential uh, effect on, for instance, the female uh, youth and their engagement in agricultural investment. Thanks. And what could be the potential solutions? Thank you, Lilian. This is a this is a very important question. As I said before, uh, young women may be may be a particular uh, subgroup in the context of youth that that has to be considered. Uh, and, and given particular attention. Uh, one thing may be the particular challenges young women face in, in accessing land, right? Uh, that may be both linked to uh, inheritance laws that may forbid them to, um, to inherit land um, that may only be given to, to the son. Uh, there may be specific challenges in terms of accessing property that may not always be easy. There may be cultural issues uh, so this, this in, in terms of specifically accessing to land, I think we, we found uh, part, particular, particular challenges. Now, uh, in, in general, I mean, there, there have been some, some, some important studies on this issue. Um, what we also noted in our work, more, more particularly, was um, that young women tended to be uh, uh, considered um, as being less able to participate in, um, in uh, decision-making processes in the youth organizations themselves. Uh, so this was, uh, was an important issue we, we identified um, here. 
and I think there again, I mean, it's it's quite important to consider the the gender dimensions within the youth organizations them, themselves, um, and to see in how far the the capacity of the young women either to engage within these organizations the way they are, or through um, eventually creating their own organizations can be strengthened. Okay, I think we can have one last question from Mariko. Okay, so my question is on institutional framework, and I think it also relates to the previous um, question. But um, um, so how did you tackle power relation between different stakeholders in participatory pr um, process to ensure um, like inclusion? Like, yeah, if you could tell me how did you deliver like discussions, it could be great. Thank you. Um, could, could you just clarify if this relates to our way to address these power imbalances in our assessment work? Yes? Yeah. Okay. No, this is a very important question. And thank you, Mariko, because we're, we're definitely very, very aware of the power imbalances that you can have. And here, I think what is very important is to have uh, facilitators in the group um, that somewhat steer uh, these, these discussions in a way to allow everybody to express themselves and also to give, of course, particular voice to those who may be in, let's say, a more fragile position, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in FAO, uh, we're, we're quite lucky because we have very good capacity development experts who have provided a series of, of trainings, but um, there are quite good manuals also out there that we have developed capacity development manuals that explain how to facilitate these, these kind of assessments. Mm -hmm. And also we, when we developed our tool, because in addition to this study, there is a tool that explains how we run these light capacity assessments mm -hmm. and the guidance notes. And in these guidance notes, we also have like specific notes for facilitators uh, that provide some specific guidance on these issues of, of ensuring inclusive discussions. Um, and quite obviously, one thing that we would note in many cases is that particularly when it comes to young people who may not be the leaders of youth organizations, but who are just members or, uh, or young agri entrepreneurs without like an organization attached, they may have particular issues in, in engaging in a discussion because um, they may be less well informed, they may uh, know the different rules and regulations less well, they may know the support programs that exist less well. So for them it can be a good experience because they learn about all these things. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, in order to ensure that they can really participate, the facilitator needs to be very careful to, to grant them this dedicated space and to also help them occasionally to reformulate the message, to make sure that everybody listens to them. So this is of course, quite an important challenge. In the end also, I think that um, uh, what we did always before we, we delivered these capacity assessments is that we had a one day uh, training workshop with the different facilitators in order to ensure that everybody's on the same page and we all um, facilitate the discussions on the, on the, on the different tables in, in the same way. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, unfortunately, I think I have to wrap this up because we really stepped out of time. Um, but first, um, on behalf of the um, Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt, Siam Bari, and other LEAP for FNSSA partners, I would like to thank you all, of course, Dr. Yannick, for this very informative session. And I would like to thank our attendees as well for being so interactive. And uh, we are looking forward to having you all again in our next webinar, we're seen in October. And um, also I would like to point that uh, this webinar was recorded and it would be uploaded on our YouTube channel if you want to get back to it anytime. So thank you again for this um, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>